The measurement of kinetic isotope effects can be a tremendously powerful tool for determining mechanism in chemical reactions. So what gives rise to a kinetic isotope effect, and, and, and what is a kinetic isotope effect? Well, there are two kinds of kinetic isotope effects distinguished by being called primary and secondary. So in a primary kinetic isotope effect, one looks at the influence of isotopic substitution on the rate of a reaction where a bond to the isotope in question is made or broken. And so in this instance, I have some reaction coordinate. I'm starting from a minimum energy structure, and I am proceeding to a transition state structure where that bond is broken. Now, it may be going on to make a different bond somewhere else as opposed to just going to an asymptote, but there are different rates depending on whether the bond is formed from a heavy isotope or a light isotope. And a typical example might be hydrogen, for instance. So the light isotope would be normal protium, just a proton in the nucleus. And the heavy isotope would be deuterium, a proton and a neutron in the nucleus. And the reason that one observes different rates is that one is not going up in energy from the bottom of the well no, there's zero point vibrational energy tied up in the normal mode. And so for uh, the heavier atom, there is less zero point vibrational energy because it has a lower frequency. Remember that the frequency of vibration is related to the uh, force constant. That's a constant, it, that's independent of isotope. So the force constant is just what's the shape of the curve. But it also depends on the reduced mass. And the reduced mass, when there's a light atom involved, is different than a heavy atom, leads to higher frequencies for the light atom, so more zero-point energy. So I climb from a higher energy level to the barrier where the bond is broken, so there's, there's no vibration left at that stage. Meanwhile, for the uh, heavier isotope, I need to climb further, and as a result, my light isotope will react more rapidly than my heavy isotope. That's known as a normal isotope effect normal primary kinetic isotope effect where the light atom reacts faster than the heavy atom. Another kind of isotope effect is a secondary kinetic isotope effect and that involves isotopic substitution in a bond that is not being made or broken but whose character changes along the reaction path. So here's the reaction coordinate. It does not involve isotopic substitution but there is some other bond or set of bonds that are substituted whose characters, so if you will, they're force constants, so I'm trying to indicate here a different, maybe it's a stretch. So if you want to have a reaction to think about, let's imagine that this is the SN2 reaction of chloride with methyl bromide. And so here's uh, methyl bromide, and along comes chloride, and it displaces it, and you make methyl chloride, and bromide goes off. But Let's say instead of CH3Br, I'm using CD3Br. Well, in the starting material, those are sp3-like carbon-hydrogen or carbon-deuterium bonds. But in the transition state structure, which is the backside attack, they are roughly sp2-like in character. So there's more s character, they're, they're higher frequency bonds. The force constant is bigger. And so it's more sensitive to the difference in reduced mass. And notice that my separation between the zero-point energy for the heavy atom and the light atom has increased compared to in the reactant, where they're closer together. And so if I work out how much I have to climb, I actually have to climb uh, higher for the light atom than I do for the heavy atom in this instance. And that will lead, again, to an isotope effect. In this case, it will actually lead to the light atom reacting less quickly, right? I have to get over a higher activation energy than the heavy atom. And so that's an inverse isotope effect when the light atom reacts more slowly than the heavy atom. And it's secondary because the, sub the isotopic substitution is not actually in a bond that's being made or broken. So computing kinetic isotope effects is tremendously straightforward. If we take our transition state theory expressions for the rate constants, k light over k heavy, with all the kt on h's drop out, we're left, this is for a unimolecular calculation, we're left with the ratio of partition functions, e to the minus delta v for the light atom, 
same ratio, but now with the heavy atoms and delta V double dagger. And if I just uh, take these, this quotient of exponentials and turn it into an exponential of a difference, the only difference appearing in these two delta V double daggers is the zero point energy. And so you just get this ratio of partition functions times an exponential of negative the difference in zero point energies. And all of that is available, of course, from a frequency calculation. And one of the reasons that this is a particularly useful tool is it gives one an opportunity to assess the quality of computed transition state structures. So, of course, experimentally, it's, it's virtually impossible to get any information about the structure of a transition state structure, its geometry, if you will. However, the kinetic isotope effect, in a sense, is a probe of the transition state structure because you've got these uh, transition state partition functions that appear in, in the universe, that's what's really happening in a flask, and of course we're computing them as well. So if you are uncertain about the quality of a computed transition state, it's your guess about a mechanism, in addition to matching the uh, energetics and the rate that you expect, if you have kinetic isotope effect data, that can be a very sensitive way to check are the computed KIEs in agreement with experimental KIEs, in which case you've uh, validated your transition state structure still further. So I'll offer just a, a quick example, again, uh, deriving from some research done at the University of Minnesota, this from the group of Mark DiStefano. And uh, so the DiStefano group is interested in protein prenylation. And prenylation is a means by which the RAS protein, which is uh, involved in carcinogenesis and hence of, of considerable interest to study, can be modified by farnesylation. And so this molecule uh, is a farnesyl or a geranyl diphosphate. So here's the diphosphate, and this is a series of isoprene units. And depending on what N is, that's either a farnesyl group or a geranyl group. And what happens is that a particular enzyme, PFTase, probably protein farnesyl transferase, although I don't remember for certain whether that's true, but it seems reasonable, uh, will react with a, a peptide sequence in some uh, protein, it could be the RAS protein, and modify a cysteine side chain to uh, do some sort of substitution at the carbon which bears the diphosphate. And if one measures kinetic isotope effects, and in this case for a isotope substitution at this position, either with a heavy atom isotope, C13, or with deuterium at that position, in which case it goes from being a primary isotope effect to a secondary isotope effect, one obtains these values. So uh, the precision on experimental measurements can be quite high. These are the associated errors. And then, I don't want to say too much about this, this is something called the commitment factor, and it's a, a measure of commitment to catalysis, which dictates uh, how much of the reaction moves forward in an enzyme active site. Uh, for our purposes, this isn't going to be important, but um, just for thoroughness, it's on the slide. But the question is, what's the structure of the transition state? And what I mean by that is, there are two means you could imagine uh, making this substitution. One would be a classic SN2 backside attack, and diphosphate's a good leaving group. The other would actually be that within the active site, perhaps the uh, diphosphate spontaneously ionizes. That's an SN1-like mechanism. And then uh, the resulting carbocation is trapped by the sulfhydryl group, and you lose a proton ultimately. So that would be an SN1-like process. Well, again, here's a place where theory may potentially be useful in comparing to those measured kinetic isotope effects. So in the absence of having some sort of a theoretical model, it's not really clear just looking at those numbers. You don't jump up and say, oh, aha, I see, that must be a SN2. There's no question about it. It's a bit ambiguous, actually. And so uh, one thing to do, of course, is to first validate a model. So here is a particular uh, flavor of density functional theory modified Purdue-Wang, hybrid functional. The N actually means it was uh, optimized for nucleophilic substitution with a modest basis set with some diffuse functions. And just looking at the reaction of uh, this much more simple uh, isoprenyl chloride, either with triphenylphosphine, which is expected to proceed in an SN2 fashion, 
or with benzyl alcohol in dimethylformamide, which is expected to go by an SN1 reaction. And so you can actually do these reactions in the laboratory and measure these experimental KIEs, 1.04, this is C13KIEs, uh, versus 0 0.997. And if you do the calculations, it's quantitatively uh, spot on, so that's good luck, but it, you know, it's certainly very close. Uh, when you do the theoretical calculation for the SN2, and to within experimental error, it's essentially one uh, for the SN1 reaction, which is to say no kinetic isotope effect. They basically react at the same rates. And uh, that seems to suggest that this computational model will be useful to explore the more complex farnesylation reaction. And so if one goes and applies MPWN, MPW1N to this process with geronyl diphosphate, and making things a tiny bit simpler, not using this rather complicated peptide model, but instead, let's just consider the side chain, ethane thiolate. So we're gonna really simplify down the computational model, but look at the reaction. And of course, uh, when we do this, we find that for the SN2-like process, these are the computed KIEs. And if you compare them to these KIEs, they're, you know, ballpark. They're certainly not uh, exquisitely uh, uh, in agreement, but they're in the right direction. They're both sort of normal isotope effects. But what one can do is do something a little bit more creative, and that is use fixed distances for the entering group, the thiolate, and the leaving group, the diphosphate, and ask the question, what are the computed KIEs as a function of holding the, the uh, nucleophilically attacking group and the leaving group at certain distances that they might uh, take in an enzyme active site because of the influence of the active site? So here we have KIEs color-coded running from 1.005, which is a very cold blue, all the way up to 1.075, which is a very hot white, on a two-dimensional plot, so different carbon sulfur distances ranging from short to long, different carbon oxygen distances ranging from short to long, and simultaneously, because we also have deuterium uh, substitution data, these are the experimental numbers, and all the values here are computational values, we can do the same thing. And so these are the HD isotope effects, these are the C13 isotope effects. We know what experiment is, and so, for instance, the C13 is 1.039. So if I look on my color scale here, wherever there's yellow, the KIE that's predicted for that structure is 1.039. And so any of these sets of two bond distances agree with experiment, and these over here. And so I'll just plot those on this graph. I'll, I'll simplify this and only show those structures that are consistent with experiment based on the calculations. And then simultaneously, the deuterium KIE is 1.068, so d d dialing in, we're somewhere around sort of an aqua-y color. And again, I'll, I'll plot it, it's right about here. So I'll plot it on here. And where is the only spot on this graph where both, where the structure is consistent with both the HD isotope effects and the C13 isotope effects? It's this one right here. So it says there's a very long carbon-sulfur bond, if you even want to call it a bond, let's call it a distance. So the nucleophile is still very far away, and the CO bond is not really broken all that much yet. It's a very early transition state. So if you like, the influence of the active site compared to the model where we just used ethane thiolate in solution is to make the reaction much looser and much more ionic. So this is a picture of the transition state structure just with ethane thiolate. And here's the leaving group, the diphosphate. And this is a plot of uh, the electrostatic potential on a van der Waals surface. So negative charge is represented as, as red and positive charge is represented as blue. And so you certainly see this very negatively charged thiolate coming in and it's doing its backside attack and the diphosphate is leaving. On the other hand, in the, the catalyzed uh, reaction, which is to say, in the one that is having the thiolate held much further away and the CO a little bit closer than in this case. So you see that this is still a very pyramidalized carbon. 
So although the, the drawing program didn't physically draw a bond here, it's long enough that it, it was outside the drawing program's uh, parameters. Nevertheless, this still looks pretty SP3-like. It's not really inverting the way it is in this system. And so uh, this is consistent with some substitution effects, which we don't have time to talk about in, in this particular video. I don't want to go into all the background. But that's an example of using KIEs, and moreover using a computational model to get KIEs as a function of geometry to really probe a transition state structure and learn important details about it. Okay, I think that wraps up what I want to say about kinetic isotope effects. The last item I think we will want to touch on will be uh, qu other quantum mechanical effects on rate constants, and we'll move to that next.